Amen. The title of the sermon this morning is um, Fear, Faith, and the Resurrection. During our discussion last Sunday, I said that the resurrection story made me happy because it had a good triumphal end. Today, I would like to modify that by saying that the story was a triumph for Jesus, but not for his followers. In the Acts of the Apostles, Luke tells that story in a second letter that he wrote to a person called Theophilus, obviously an important Roman citizen and a trusted ally of the disciples. The Acts of the Apostles comprises the first historical record of the Christian church. And I would suggest that during these days of being at home, that you might assign yourself the task of reading that whole book. Uh, it is not very long, and it will not take very long to read. Since their leader, Jesus of Nazareth, had been recently tried, tortured, and killed in the worst possible way by a conspiracy between the Roman authorities, the disciples, and the Jews, the disciples, the women, and the mother of Jesus were all hunkered down in a safe space, much like we are hunkered down ourselves these days. Consumed with anxiety and fear, they were trying to understand the recent events and who they were. Most important, they were bent on explaining to themselves and to others the meaning of their experience with Jesus, and especially how that story was tied to the ancient prophetic teaching concerning the Messiah, whom they had long hoped would come to restore the greatness of the Jewish kingdom. And since Judas had betrayed them to their enemies, their first act was to replace him so that they would once again reflect Jesus' will that they be representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. And thus, through the act of prayer and voting, Matthias was elected to replace Judas. And that action was followed by the story of Pentecost, which Jesus had promised, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon them as divine comforter. And we are told that Jews had gathered from all over the world. And though they spoke many different languages, they all seemed to understand one another. And yet the noise was so great that some made fun of them and said that they had had too much to drink. And the narrative states that Peter quickly spoke and said firmly that since it was only nine o'clock in the morning, they could not be drunk. And he then reminded them of the prophet Joel and quoted him at length as proclaiming that in the last days, God promised to pour out God's spirit on all the people, men and women alike, and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He then proceeded to tell them that God had enabled Jesus to perform miracles and that they, with the help of others, put him to death on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and thereby released him from the grip of death. Peter then connected the prophet Joel's teaching to the words of their greatest King David himself, in whose lineage the Messiah was expected to come. And David had prophesied the resurrection in Psalm 16, seven to 11, uh, which was read 
by Anne this morning. And thus Peter's sermon connected the resurrection of Jesus to the teaching of the most authoritative sources in the Jewish tradition, the prophetic tradition by quoting the teaching of the prophet Joel and the royal tradition by quoting the teaching of King David himself. And these were the most authoritative sources of truth in the Jewish tradition. No greater proof of the Messiah was possible. The disciples emphasized the fact that they themselves had been witnesses to Jesus' life, to his teaching and mighty works of healing, along with his suffering, death, and resurrection. And thus they believed that he was the long expected Messiah. Yet the traditional expectation of the Messiah coming as a king differed greatly from the Jesus of Nazareth whom they knew and who came as a teacher bent on reforming the tradition and wholly devoted to the mission of liberating the poor and the oppressed, women, children, the sick, the disabled, the stranger, the enemy, and replacing the mighty and powerful with the lowly and ordinary people. In fact, the Messiah himself became lowly by suffering and dying a terrible death, which admittedly contradicted the traditional expectation. Nonetheless, the faith that Peter proclaimed in the resurrected Christ, grounded in the most authoritative sources of the Jewish faith, did not eradicate the fear in which they presently lived and would continue to live for the rest of their lives. They all knew that their religious and political rulers were aligned against them and that that comprised a very dangerous situation. And like all people who are threatened by the social, political, and religious powers of their day, this relatively small group of survivors was destined for a lifetime of stress, unease, anxiety, insecurity, and fear, because those who had power over them did not believe in their story that their Jesus, who had suffered, died, and rose from the dead, was truly the expected Messiah. And thus their belief in the resurrection did not spare them from a life of suffering, a life of fear, and even death. Yet their faith in the risen Lord enabled them to live together in a commune, sharing all things in common, breaking bread, eating together, enjoying one another's company, caring for one another, and praising God. And we are told, surprisingly, that their numbers grew day by day because of God's salvific love that they embraced and which enabled them to love and care for one another. And though they tried to live peacefully and not offend, offend others, their actual presence seemed in itself to be offensive, largely because they lived differently. And like Jesus, they interpreted the scriptures differently by telling the people that the risen Jesus who had suffered and died, had actually fulfilled the teaching of their ancient prophetic and royal traditions, and that he promises to return again to restore everything anew. Nonetheless, the disciples, Peter and John, were tried before the Sanhedrin. They were put to death, supposedly before they had healed, supposedly because they had healed a disabled man in the name of the risen Jesus. The problem lay not in the healing of the man, but doing so in the name 
of the risen Christ. And that was the problem, and it remains so, as long as the disciples continued to proclaim their belief in the risen Christ. They were dubbed a sect, a badge of dishonor, and hence, like all, all minority groups, they became the subject of scorn and abuse. And since there was no such thing in those days as religious liberty anywhere in the world, all whose religious views differed from those of the ruling elites risked persecution. And thus the Acts of the Apostles speak about Peter and John, both being tried and flogged and imprisoned, as were James, the brother of Jesus, who was also put to death by the sword. And Stephen, appointed as a deacon in their group, was stoned to death. And Peter himself was later jailed and executed. Paul and Barnabas were persecuted, stoned, flogged, and jailed. And according to tradition, Paul, the writer of over half of the New Testament, was himself executed. And thus Christians endured a long, bitter history of suffering, strife, fear, and death. From time to time, the persecutions relented whenever the Christians found favor with their rulers. A similar, though altogether unique event culminated much later in the fourth century when the Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity and won a major battle, which like all imperial battles, he attributed to the power of God, and this time to the Christian God to whom he had recently converted. Soon thereafter, he declared Christianity to be the official religion of the state, and that remained the case throughout the Roman Empire until the 16th century Protestant Reformation. Thereafter, as always, the state's religious authorities persecuted all dissenters as heretics, and the next several centuries witnessed the struggle for religious liberty and the gradual ascendancy of the dissenting groups who often aligned themselves with other social and political elites to oppress all whom they considered outsiders. Both then and now, those in power threatened those without power. And those without power live in faith and fear, even though they are more likely to follow Jesus Christ more faithfully. And even during this present pandemic, the powerless are suffering in larger numbers than the powerful. Yet Jesus promised that they would inherit the kingdom of God. And that gift of faith empowers all who trust in Christ to overcome their fears because God is with them. And where God is, all is well. Now is the time for you to share your thoughts and reflections on this early church experience of the disciples following the, the resurrection of Christ. Amen, thank you, Peter. If you would like to share, just a reminder that you can put your hand up and I'll unmute you, or you can unmute yourself by clicking on your screen or going to the bottom left hand of your screen. Hi, this is Allison. Um, I've, I especially like that uh, Peter was talking about fear. It seems to me that um, in this uh, uh, time of the COVID virus and all, people are uh, experiencing so much loneliness and that really ties in with, with fear. Think about if you were in prison, what would you fear the most that the guards or the, the high ups in the prison could do to you? They could put you into solitary confinement. That's you know really the the worst I think um, 
you know, the thing that I would fear the most if I were put into prison. Um, in, in Delaware, during uh, slave times, the uh, slave owners were allowed to beat the, um, uh, the slaves or chain them up or whatever. But really, I think the worst thing that, that uh, they were allowed to do was to separate families and sell a wife away from the husband or the, you know, the father away from the, the kids. And then I was thinking also how really important it is that Jesus uh, said multiple times, I will always be with you. I'll stay with you always. So it seems to me those, those things kind of tie in together. But uh, this is such a, a time of loneliness. I at least have David here. <laughs> We're getting kind of sick of each other, but at least we have each other. And, uh, you know, but I really miss uh, hugging my grandkids and, you know, hugging friends and all that. I think touch is such an important part of feeling uh, happy. That's all. I liked um, Peter a reminder again that uh, the power of God is with the powerless. And, and that there is a bridge there that takes some faith to step through because when those in power have a direct impact on our life like this, where the resources come, um, and where we're, you know, our shot jobs are shut down. It's it's a little harder to hang on to the idea that the uh, humble are where or God empowers. But it has been my experience that anytime those that are in in, I guess, less fortunate circumstances seem to have a greater amount of faith. And it was uh, a good reminder that in this time when we feel less fortunate in those circumstances that. The Spirit of God is often much closer to us. So thank you. Amen. Jaxie, you're unmuted. Well, I was just going to reply to what Allison said about loneliness because I live by myself and I can't tell you what it means to join you on Sunday. Um, it, it, it is really, it lifts my spirit and helps me get through the week. And I thank you for that. Amen. Thank you. Peter, I wanna thank you too for making the connection between the disciples hunkered down in the upper room and what what we're experiencing now. Um, I think we forget sometimes how lost they must have been, not knowing, you know, what was going to happen and um, fear, very real, real fear of the authorities. Um, but I think not only feeling the fear, but the loss and the confusion, um, which I think leads to more fear. And a lot of us right now are struggling to understand what's going on and what tomorrow or next week or next month is going to look like. Um, and they certainly didn't, um, didn't know what was going to happen, but they had the faith, um, and the message, you are not alone, um, do not be afraid, for I am with you, is even more powerful knowing the situation in which they were in and that we're all in now, too. Although I think theirs was a lot more dire than ours, as you very well pointed out in your, um, in your message. Thank you. Amen. And I think we can say together the prayer of thanksgiving, and it will be followed by Marion Anderson singing, Let us break bread together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your spiritual gifts that enable us to discern more clearly who you are 
and how your son Jesus manifested your will for all human beings. We give you thanks for your grace that enables us to proclaim your word and sustain your work of love and justice among all your peoples. Amen. Amen.